Good morning. Uh, we're in stewardship month here at Faith Baptist Church. And just taking a little time this morning to remind you about this matter of stewardship. Um, all month long, you're going to hear from us, um, different Sunday school teachers and um, testimonies in church. Time, talent, and treasure. Uh, think about the value of a mechanic. A guy who knows just tires, perhaps. Uh, when I was in college, I worked in a diesel shop, and I, I was the gopher for the mechanic, and I worked on big Detroit and Cummins engines, but I didn't know anything about it. I just did what I was told. But when it came to tires, I knew tires. And I changed split rims and regular rims, and uh, those been back, this is, again, 45 years ago, uh, big aluminum uh, wheels, and, and um, changed them without air and compressors and sometimes with and out on the road did emergency road repairs but um, I didn't have to know how to run the rack or or do some rebuild on an engine if a guy had a flat he just needed someone to fix his flat tire and I could get out there and do that and uh, and you know, in those days um, we'd charge a hundred dollars for me to go to go to the truck um, Often, with if I didn't have uh, compressors and things, I'd do it all by hand and, and take the, the tire, go to a station, get it aired up and together, and back to the truck, back on. And um, my boss paid me $5 an hour. Might be a two, two hour job. And the boss, uh, you know, spent $10 on me and got $100 from the driver. So it was a profitable thing for the boss. And I just need to get my school bill paid. But, um, I didn't have to do everything to be valuable. I was valuable in my one area. And when we think about our, our church bus ministry, um, how valuable is it to just clean a bus, just to keep a bus's tires in good shape or to uh, check lights and oil and fluids and things like that. And it comes to brakes and safety things. We need, we need certified uh, mechanics, but but um, the, the value of a mechanic, you know, maybe the guy's not going to preach. But if he can keep a bus on the road, think how many hundreds of people are going to come hear the gospel because of a mechanic. And it's keeping our understanding of, of talents. What talents do we have at our camps? We have on occasion, we get to use a camp. Uh, we find a camp that will let us do our own kitchen, which we like. We have more control of the atmosphere and the appearance and a whole bunch of things. But one thing, it's a lot cheaper. But uh, like this summer camp, I don't know, we had 150, I don't know, maybe even 175 young people at our teen camp. Um, that is a lot of cooking. But a group of our folks provided three meals a day for our young people. And it was good food and it, was, it saved us a ton of money. But there are people who, who missed work to come up and cook. And one of our meals, the some of the folks from our Filipino Sunday school came up and, and they had pre-made lumpia, but it wasn't deep fried. So the guys were out in the outside with these great big deep fryers and frying the lumpia. And, and um, you know, that's using talents to help the work of God. And we've all got gifts and talents, but just a reminder, your time, talent, and treasure, what are you doing with it? Is Does God get any of that pie that is for me, Bruce Goddard, and here's my time, here's my talents, here's my treasure. Does God get any of it? Does God get what he deserves? And I want to encourage you. One of the things, I got an offering envelope here, nothing written on it, but this is an example. We all understand the term to diversify our portfolio. You want some, maybe, and I don't do any of this, but maybe you do. You invest and you want some money in gold and you want some money in some kind of a you know, oil or whatever, or <laughs> put some money wherever it is that you put money, hoping that the stock grow well. So I've got, um, I can put some money in, and I put a check in here or cash in here. Um, and uh, and then I, I mark on the bus, some of this money's for the bus ministry. I want in on that. I want to invest in buses. Some of it's in the building fund. We were, <laughs> we are full at church and that's a blessing. Um, and um, we need this new building to go up. And so I'm going to get in on that. And then Mighty Mites. Now, the Mighty Mites, um, some couple, few years ago, we started that because we were, um, just money was tight. 
And we just said, maybe you're like that widow who could put in the two mites above the tithe. And, um, and that money is there and see how God will multiply it. And many, many times we've been under budget on a Sunday, but there's money piled up in the Mighty Mites Fund that covered that, lot, that under budget so we were able to make budget. And so investing there. Then there's a, a slot for the school. Oh, our Christian school has put so many young people into the ministry. And so many young people just out in secular work successful. And I hear stories regularly, just amazing stories. Well, I don't have kids in the school. My, my youngest graduated some years ago, already married and out of college. But I put money into the Christian school every week because I want in on the, pro, on the profits, spiritually speaking, not financially. I want in on the, the, the blessings that come from our Christian school. And then of course, tithe, we put that in uh, because it's just, that's what we ought to do. Um, and then our Wednesday offering every week, um, most weeks we give away our Wednesday offering to something outside the church. Sometimes it's it's a others cause in the church, like maybe this, uh, this Sunday, I think it's the 19th, but it may not be, but it's the Sunday right before Thanksgiving. We're gonna have a big day and uh, we'll be out in the community. We're, instead of bringing people to church, we'll, go, we'll bring church to the people and we'll, We'll buy groceries and we'll bring some special things out. This just we're talking just days before Christmas and uh, some gifts that parents could get for children. And so that Wednesday offering might be uh, an offering for a big day, but normally we give it away to missionaries or widows or people in need around the country. And it's just um, so I want in on that every week. I want to put something that Wednesday because I want to be a help. I want to invest what God has given me my treasure. I want to invest it in others and most certainly or in, invest it in a diversion, a diversity of things. But I, I just want, I want to be a good steward of what God's given me. And I, and I know I've failed, but I, I long to be a good steward. And if I have five years left before I go to heaven, I would love God to get everything he can get out of those five years. If I've got 10 or 15 years, great. But I still want him to get everything he can. And for our young people, I, uh, I know some of our young people, a, uh, I won't call a name, but to uh, uh, we've got a young lady that rides our bus, just watches all my morning moments. Good morning to you. Um, and uh, as our young people, I think our young people got a whole lifetime. Oh, let's, let's make sure we make plans. Boy, for a young person to marry an unsaved person, talk about robbing the chance to do some things for God because... Now you're in a relationship and you're bound to a different philosophy and you're going to be sharing and, and um, you expect to have a liberty to do some things you want while you're going to join them and things they want. It's going to be very awkward. And so stewardship, being very careful to steward what God has given us, whatever it might be. And I think, uh, we talked about this the other day, but I think we ought to consider a, a living trust and put God right in, put him right into it. And uh, make it clear up front that, um, you know, let's just say all my assets are going to be sold. And there it all lays out there. And I'm going to take um, this pile of whatever it is uh, that I've left behind me. And it might be $1.95 or it might be $1.95, whatever. But um, first, God gets his. First thing. My estate, before anybody else gets anything, um, I'm going to make sure God gets his chunk. Whatever you want to do with it, I know. I know some people who said they put enough of their estate into the the church in case their kids didn't tithe. They wanted to make sure that there was a tithe in there, whether their kids did or not. But all right, I've got. In my case, I got four kids. So let's just say my wife has already gone to heaven before me, and and I look at my estate and think, all right, I got four kids and God. So everything I have is going to be divided up by five. And I might not. I might give it all to, to missions and tell the kids, you've done well. God bless you. You don't need anything I've got. I have no idea. But, but all of us should consider um, our treasure. Now, today, um, and being a good steward of our treasure, in Luke chapter 16, on uh, this last Sunday, <clears throat> I talked about this. And I want to take a moment or two to remind you of this because too often we live as if there is no eternal and uh, last, uh, on, last on Sunday, I, I talked about everybody that dies goes to heaven or goes to hell. There's only two places you go. 
Nobody's in between. There's no holding ground. If you're saved, the moment you stop breathing, Paul said to be absent from the body is be present with the Lord. My body may be in a casket kit, but I'm already gone. I've left this old shell um, that's caused me no end of grief, and I'm in the presence of Christ. Body, soul, and spirit. Body can stay in the grave. Soul and spirit go straight to be with Jesus. An unsaved person doesn't have a spirit, body, and soul. Their body lays in the grave, and their soul goes straight to hell. Only two places. I want to show you, and, and many of you probably were in church, but I don't want this to be missed. In Luke 16, 19, this rich man, very wealthy, a beggar's at his gate, and both of them die. And it says that um, the uh, in verse 23 of Luke 16, it says of the rich man, and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Now, riches don't get you into heaven. And I remember somebody saying one day that uh, they were interviewing people at a college level, going to universities, and they said, you know, take a Marilyn Monroe that I think she died at 32 or 35. And um, they said, this is a, a young adult, said, if I could be that famous, I'd be willing to die at 35. And I thought, what? a waste. Tell me one thing Marilyn Monroe gave to this world. Tell me anything, any good, anything, I, and I don't know, may, maybe she is a Sunday school teacher and maybe she uh, went, uh, went to, worked in Red Cross camps at, uh, with uh, victims of hurricanes. Maybe she had her, took her money and traveled to uh, some uh, tropical island where there was a terrible volcano or floods or tsunami and, and she may have taken her money and just been a blessing, but I'm guessing not. I'm just guessing Hollywood doesn't typically do that. I mean, they might. Um, I'm, I'm pretty isolated, but uh, why would we choose fame over a future? You see, this guy's in hell. How many seconds would we need to be in a literal lake of fire before we regret making that decision to go to hell. And so I might say, well, I, I, don't, I didn't make a decision to go to hell. If you make a decision to not trust Christ, you made the decision to go to hell. This guy's in hell. John chapter three, he that hath the son of God, he that hath the son hath life. He that hath not the son of God, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. John 3, verses 36, down in that area, toward the end of the chapter. Now, we need to understand that if you do not accept Christ, you are already under the wrath of God. God's anger is already on you. And that's why we need to go soul winning. That's why we need to witness to friends. And if you don't know exactly how to witness to them, bring them to church. Say, look, come to church. Let someone at my church talk to you about how you can go to heaven. If you never come to church again, please at least come and hear how to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from the penalty of our sin. And, uh, and then find a new life in Christ. Well, this guy's in hell. Why? Because he chose to ignore the redemption that God offered him. And we don't know what all he did that was wrong, but we're all sinners, all of us. But I want you to notice some things. He lifted up his eyes. So you can you have eyes in hell, a physical body. You've heard stories of people who lost a finger or lost a limb, and they can still feel it sometimes. Their nerves are there. And doctors say, well, it's just nerves that are thinking the nerve endings are still there. No, you're a soul. And the soul is like an inner tube. You have a football. You got this leather outside with some threads on it. Inside it is a rubber inner tube. And that inner tube is the exact shape of that exterior leather football. And inside you, inside this body, there is a soul that is the exact size and shape of the body that you see. And when this body dies, the soul doesn't. The soul never dies. But this body, my you can, you can cut my hand off and you can take the body part away, but the soul hand is still there. And that's why people still feel it. But doctors don't want to want to admit that. But this soul is still there. And when I die, I might be, and I'm saved, but if I were unsaved, my body might be in the, the, the uh, casket. And people can say all kinds of nice things about me. But the bottom line is my soul, this fit, it's got fingers, it's got eyes, it's got ears, it's got a tongue this body will be in a lake of eternal fire. 
And the reason, see this physical body can burn up, but your soul can't burn up. That's how a person can be in hell forever. And you might think, yeah, I can't even fathom forever. I can't either. Of course we can't fathom. We're temporal. We can't fathom the internal. But you, you reject Christ and you will experience forever in hell. And so in hell, there's eyes. And um, in verse 24, he cries to Abraham. So he knows he's got a mind. He's got thought. He cries out for mercy. In heaven, there will be people cry in hell. There'll be people crying out for mercy. And it says, I am tormented in this flame. The end of verse 24, there is a torment that the soul will face. The soul that, that does not trust Christ. When we choose to ignore the gift of eternal life, we go to hell and, and that torment is there and we will cry out for mercy and there will be no mercy as there was none in this story. But I want you to notice the physical things, the, the visual, the mental. He wants a, a drop of water in his tongue. He's got a tongue. He can cry out. He can speak. He can cry. Abraham says to him, remember in thy lifetime thou receivest good things. We have a memory in hell. And I believe in hell, people will remember every time they ignored the gospel. I think they'll remember every gospel tract that was offered to them. I think they'll remember every radio or TV station as they went by and they heard a little bleep or two of a preacher and they skip right over it because they're not interested. I believe they'll see that and think that and remember that over and over and over. In hell, they'll remember in their mind, in their eyes, they'll remember seeing these things. And it is a tragic, horrible place. In the end of verse 25, Abraham says, Thou, you're tormented. Those up in heaven are comforted. And he goes on, he says in verse 27, Send Lazarus to my father's house. I've got five brothers. We're going to remember the lost. And we're going to be burdened for the lost. And we're going to regret. We'll end up in hell and we'll regret. We'll think about our children that may not be saved. A person in hell is going to remember their spouse that's not saved. I believe they're going to remember their spouse that is saved too. And they'll regret not listening. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he's going to remember, he's going to remember the times he heard the gospel. He's going to remember the times he was invited to church. And he's going to remember people. And, he's, and, and the torment of realizing those people that I love are coming here and they're going to burn in this hell forever. This is, this is the most tragic thing imaginable. And it's going to go on and on. And he begs him. And uh, just, just want, there's a lot more scripture on hell. And Sunday was so busy. And we had some great things go on Sunday morning. So I trimmed my sermon quite a bit. But there's a lot of scripture on hell. Place of torment, place of flame, place of darkness, place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You neglect what Jesus did for you, you will not escape. And we better be very conscious of the reality of you're saved or you're lost. You've trusted Christ or you have not. Your loved ones, they're saved or they're lost. And it ought to break our heart. And that's why we do what we do. It's why we run buses. It's why we go to jails and rest homes. It's why we send money overseas. It's why we send our people overseas. Because heaven's real a beautiful place, and I'll take time this morning, but over in the end of Revelation, it talks about the golden streets, the gates of pearl, the river of life, and the tree of life with 12 different kinds of fruit, a different kind of fruit every month. And Jesus is there, and he's the light, and there'll be songs of praise and worship, and oh, it'll be a wonderful place, a heavenly kingdom. There'll be an earthly kingdom. Nothing that we can even imagine is going to compare to the glory in heaven, heaven or hell. Why do we do what we do? Because number one, I know I'm going to heaven. I want others there. Number two, I don't want people in hell. And I hope you'll pray. Pray for our community. Pray for our country. Our country is racing to hell on purpose and hating God and gnashing against God. And oh, in hell, no one's going to be. Uh, no one's going to be arrogant. No one is going to be uh, no one is going to be saying, I want to be in hell drinking beer with my friends. None of that. There'll be no time with friends. There'll be no beer. Uh, there'll be no pool games. There's nobody going to be riding their Harley up and down the streets of hell. Not a chance. There'll be torment and flame and sorrow and tears and crying and agony. And I hope we as a church stay conscious of the lost. I have a good day. Thank God for heaven 
and look forward to it. I hope we go today. And I hope between when I got this recorded and get it uploaded to you, I hope we've, we've already gone to heaven. Maybe some lost person will watch this and trust Christ. Thanks for joining us today.